It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of December 12, 2003. Uh, we've got five movies to look at today, so a lot of films to get to. Let's not waste any more time and get right to it. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, Jack Nicholson and Diane Keaton in Nancy Myers' latest film, Something's Gotta Give. And I will say this, um, for those audiences out there who've been waiting to see a 63-year-old Jack Nicholson, a 56-year-old Diane Keaton, and um, Amanda Peet buck na uh, near buck naked, um, here's your movie right here. In fact, Diane Keaton actually does get naked in this PG-13 movie, which I was actually kind of surprised by. I was just like, wow, they actually, they actually let that through. Um, I don't know, maybe because she wasn't doing anything sexual or anything, but it's just normal life, or I don't know, but... I was surprised when I saw that. I was just like, whoa, where did the hell did that come from? But, um, hey, it's an Nancy Myers movie, and she usually makes a lot of very good films, and um, this one is definitely that. You have Jack Nicholson and Diane Keaton, who are professionals who find love for each other in later life, despite being complete opposites. And, you know, Jack Nicholson's dating Amanda Peet, which I find it kind of funny, because Amanda Peet also was dating an older man in Bruce Willis in the, whole, in the uh, sequel The Whole Ten Yards, which came out shortly after this. Uh, she wasn't dating her, her in the... Um, dating him in the uh, first movie, but they became a couple in the second film, and uh, Diane Keaton seeing Keanu Reeves, Neo from The Matrix, and um, I think this movie kind of gives you an idea that Keanu Reeves isn't just a plain mediocre actor in general, like, he has range, and to be with those talents, I mean, Jack Nicholson, Diane Keaton, there's also Francis McDorman, John Favreau was in this movie as well, that's, um, that's a pretty tall feat to accomplish, and the film does very well with it, and you know, the film just works. It's a mainstream movie with two uh, two titans of actors working working together here, and they're supposed to play people who have, a, have an affinity for younger people, and yet they find this chemistry that just works so well. And just be, and it's like I said, the writing of Nancy Myers. I mean, this is the person that made the Father of the Bride movies look as good as they did. I mean, she did The Holiday. She did, um, uh, what was the one she did recently? Um, can't remember it. Can't remember it. Complicated. That's the one I'm thinking of. It's complicated, which um, does not have her in it. It's Meryl Streep in that one. And even The Intern with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway is surprisingly really good. She did also uh, What Women Want and The Parent Trap. I mean, she's a really damn good director in general. And this is just another film that really shows what she's capable of doing as a filmmaker. And she just makes it work. The acting is great. The comedy is very funny. The, the writing overall is very good. It's a really good crowd-pleasing movie. It's a film that was a massive success for good reason. It shows that these are two titans of actors who can work off each other really well. And they're just it's just a great, great film. It's a fun film. A really good time overall. I can't really say too much more about it. That hasn't already been said. It's a really damn good movie and one that I do indeed recommend checking out. So... So that's something's got to give. Let's move on to the next movie, uh, The Fairly Brothers with a new film. Probably one of their most underrated movies, in my opinion. Greg Kinnear, Matt Damon, and Cher in Stuck on You. This is Stuck on You, where you have Matt Damon and Greg Kinnear as conjoined twin brothers whose conflicting aspirations provide both conflict and humorous situations, in particular which one of them, when one of them wishes to move from Hollywood to pursue a career as an actor. And uh, chaos and hilarity ensues, with Ava Mendez and Seymour Cassell among the peak cast in here. And you know, for the Fairley Brothers, this is actually one of their more tamer movies by comparison, and maybe that's why the film didn't do so well at the box office. It was actually seen as kind of an underperformer, even though it did make its budget back at $55 million, with a $65 million worldwide gross. It was a film that was not particularly well received in general compared to some of their other movies, and quite frankly, I don't understand why, because it was a movie that actually was legitimately a good film. Maybe it's because I think people expected more gross-out humor from the Fairley Brothers, but made a couple movies that were much more tamer, and there's nothing wrong with being tamer as long as the movies are good. I mean, they did this, and then they followed up with Fever Pitch, which I think is a criminally underrated Fairley Brothers movie. Probably the one good movie Jimmy Fallon ever did as an actor, which isn't really a whole lot, but he gets kind of a bad rap for The Tonight Show, and um, let's just say that um, as of the time of recording this, I'm preparing a little do a little documentary for the 70th anniversary of The Tonight Show, and I wanted to rewatch the Jimmy Fall watch the Jimmy Fallon one to get ready for that, but... Um, uh, needless to say, there's going to be a lot to talk about, and I might even do it this week on the Reviewing Network Live, but um, let's just say that uh, 
the funny di- the days when Jimmy Fallon was actually funny are kind of are kind of past it at this point. But um, we're not here to talk about Jimmy Fallon, at least not yet. We'll get to his movies starting with Taxi next year. But we're here to talk about this movie here. And you know what? Like I said, it's a fun movie. I like these two. I like Matt Damon and Greg Kinnear working off each other. I like that the they're Siamese twins. Like the thing, like the thing that's literally holding them together. Like it looks kind of fake, but at the same time, it kind of looks authentic at the same time. And it's just. It's funny. Like, it's a funny, funny movie. A film that is so cleverly written. Like, I like how Cher's able to make fun of herself in this. Like, there's a whole thing where she's dating Frankie Muniz from Malcolm in the Middle, which is kind of amusing in its own ways and probably is pro- the darkest joke that this movie probably goes into. But um, I will admit the ending does go a little bit too long. In fact, I will say this. The last maybe 20, 30 minutes does go over a little bit too much. Mo- it does overstay its welcome, and I won't say it's a great, great film, but it's definitely a film that I think deserves a lot more credit than it actually gets. It's a film that's actually very funny. The last 30 minutes, though, I will say, do kind of slow it down a little bit, but never to the point where I feel like I, need, I, feel like I have to look, I have to say it's a bad movie. I still think this is a really good film overall. I do recommend checking it out. It's definitely one of the Fairly Brothers' most underrated movies, in my personal opinion, so... So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is Love Don't Cost a Thing. It's amazing that Jennifer Lopez was involved in this. They must have paid a lot of money to actually use the title of that, since that's based off of her song. And uh, this is also written by uh, the same guy and directed by the same guy that wrote Baps, which... um. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a good sign whatsoever. And uh, you have a movie here that's essentially a remake of Can't Buy Me Love from 1987 that starred Patrick Dempsey. And in it, Nick Cannon plays a nerdy kid who's skilled in designing car engines. And when she when he's got this crush on Christiana Milan from Tyena, you remember that show from Nickelodeon. And you know her car crashes, and you know he's able he's all, he's asked he's willing to fix the car. On the condition that he pretends to be his girlfriend. And, um... So basically the whole movie, he's just sipping for this girl. But I think really the overall feeling of this movie is... Why would you want to remake Can't Buy Me Love? I mean, not to say that it's a bad movie by any means necessary, but... Can't Buy Me Love did not have the lasting legacy that I think this director think it, thinks it really did. Because, you know, it's a, it's an 80s to teen movie that, you know... Simple premise, Patrick Dempsey... Kind of wants to do the same thing. Wants to ha- wants to get the girl of his dreams, but he's a nerd, and so he basically says, "I'll pay you money to be my girlfriend." Except in this t- in this case, it's basically Christina and Milan being just simply asked to do by Nick Cannon to do it because you know of her car issue with the car. And I'm sorry, I can't buy Nick Cannon as a nerd more than I can buy Patrick Dempsey as a nerd. Patrick Dempsey's a nerd and can't buy me love. I could buy, but here he's just trying way too hard. Especially since a year before this, he was in Drumline and looking more confident than he does in this. Like this was getting to a point where it was just like, okay, you're past the point where you can make this work on as it's as you're trying to make this work as it does. But um, I mean, you also got Steve Harvey in here who's fine, I guess. I mean, Keenan Thompson's in here, Cal Penn. Uh, Regan Gomez Preston from The Cleveland Show, Nicole Scherzinger, Pre Pussycat Dolls, Dante Bosco is in here as a spoken word artist. But other than that, though, this is. I guess I could say it's not as bad as BAPS, but it doesn't make it a good movie either. It just makes it kind of a mediocre film at best. Nothing too spectacular, nothing too amazing, and you can't really buy into the chemistry either. And just like I said, the whole purpose of the film is supposed to be, you know, like, it's supposed to be, like, Seeks of High that Can't Buy Me Love left such a lasting impact on people that this movie had to be remade for a new generation. And no, it just simply was not. But it's here, and uh, yeah, I've got nothing really good to say about it other than what I just said. So, so how about we get to some good movies? Let's go ahead and move on back to the good stuff. Let's go to Tim Burton's Big Fish. This is an amazing movie, man. I love this movie so much. You have the story of a frustrated son who tries to distinguish fact from fiction in the life of his father, a teller of tell tales. Uh, you have Ewan McGregor playing the younger version of William Bloom, and Albert Finney's the older version. Billy Crudup is the is the kid is the son. Jessica Lange is 
uh, William's wife. Helen Bottom Carter is also in here. Alison Lohman is a younger version of Jessica Lange's character. You have Robert Guillaume, Marion Cotillard, Steve Buscemi, Danny DeVito in a role that he would play again basically 16 years later in Dumbo. It's literally the same role in Dumbo, pretty much. But but in here, it's just a great film in general. You have the, the theme of reconciliation, and it became part of the reason why Tim Burton actually decided to do it because it had special significance for him because his father died in 2000 and then he lost his mother two years later after he before he signed on to direct the film. And you could just see the passion he has in this movie. This is just a beautifully put together film from a visual perspective, from a storytelling perspective, which is a terrific cast led by Ewan McGregor. If you didn't think Obi-Wan Kenobi could act before this movie came out, this movie proved that, proved that he can do that and then some because he is incredible in this film. Like I said, the visual aspect of the movie is amazing. This is to probably one of Tim Burton's best films. I mean, this is a film that is just so well put together, so enticing, so engaging, a terrific score once again by Danny Elfman. Just, just a brilliant, brilliant movie, man. This is a classic film on a number of levels. Really, a film that I don't think gets the proper respect that it deserves. I mean, yeah, Tim Burton's gotten a bad rap over the years, but man, I can't recommend this movie enough. Terrific film, amazing film. Freaking Big Fish, man. If you haven't seen it, you're missing out on a terrific, terrific film. Uh, speaking of terrific films, let's go ahead and wrap up this show by taking a look at the last film we have here, and that is Scarlett Johansson in The Girl with a Pearl Earring. Based off of the novel of the same name, you have Scarlett Johansson starring as Gideon, a young 17th century servant in the house of this Dutch painter played by Colin Firth at the time he painted The Girl with a Pearl Earring in the city of Delft in Holland. This also has Tom Wilkinson, Killian Murphy, Essie Davis, and uh, Judy Perfect. And in a year where Scarlett Johansson just really was taken off with Lost in Translation, here's another film that pro doesn't get really the proper attention that I think it does because Lost in Translation came out, and that is a much better film. But man, it's a fit. this is another film that shows that Scarlett Johansson has a future in had a future going for her. Kind of like with Ewan McGregor and Big Fish, but here... Like, she looks like the person in the painting, and it's just incredible how much of a similarity there is between her and the, and the woman in the painting. It's just, it's a, it's a really engaging film. It's a film that does not go against, the, does go against the norms of a typical period film, and actually does something very different and very unique with it to make it stand out on its own. It's a film that is visually gorgeous to look at, features a top-notch cast of really talented people, some great music by Alexander Desplat, some great cinematography. What more do I have to say, man? It's a great film. Definitely a film that's very much underrated in general. It's a film that I do recommend checking out, especially for Scarlett Johansson's performance. It's just another great film. A great one to wrap the show up with. Girl with a Pearl Earring. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. We'll head into the week before Christmas with easily the biggest new release of the weekend, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, the end of Pat Peter Jackson's legendary trilogy, we also have Julia Roberts in the ensemble film Mona Lisa Smile, Helen Mirren in Calendar Girls, and also House of Sand and Fog. So four films to look at next time around. We'll delve into those on the next episode. But until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the place on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. And don't go too far away, because Time About the Movies flashback returns after a week away, with six movies to look at, including Roman Polanski's Frantic with Harrison Ford, the comedy A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon, the musical version of Hairspray, uh, Hairspray directed by John Waters, not the musical version, but the original Hairspray, Jean-Claude Van Damme in Blood Sport, Aloha Summer, and Pierce Brosnan in Taffin. So we'll take a look at those six movies on the next episode, on uh, Time About the Movies flashback, which will be coming up in just a little bit, right after this.